So if you can open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews this morning, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to open our message by reading a section in Hebrews. We're actually going to reference a number of scriptures, but I wanted to read this, sort of launch our, our message this morning. So Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. Chapter 10 and verse 12. 12. We won't walk through all this passage, but it sets the stage for all that I want to talk about this morning. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. The writer says this, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Marvelous, marvelous celebration of the finished work the once and for all and completed work of Jesus Christ in saving sinners and bringing them into a relationship with God and resulting in a boldness that you notice there in verse 19 that believers, believers should have in drawing near to God confidently because that once and for all sacrifice has been made. Now the question for us is, I think, is the grace of the Lord Jesus defining our ongoing relationship with God? Is grace or is legalism defining our daily relationship with God? That's the examination I want to make of our own hearts this morning. I want us to kind of take the truth of God's word and shine the light of it onto our hearts and ask that question. Is grace or legalism defining our daily relationship with God? And I want to press it beyond merely a technical understanding of legalism. So here's what I mean. A technical legalism might be somebody that would say explicitly, it is my works that saves me, that brings me into a right place with God. Because of what I do, God is favorable towards me. Now, some of you might have that perception that that's actually what the Bible teaches. It is not. It is not. You might technically need to have your definition of salvation adjusted, that it is by grace alone and not by works. But I think for many of us, we have that technical definition in our minds. We, we would never say, my righteousness gets me to God. We would never say that. But functionally, at the level of our feelings and how we relate to God and how we think he views us, what we feel like about God on a daily basis, what kinds of things we do to feel like we are closer to God and feel as though we have warded off punishment for our sins, functionally, legalism can creep in and can be the functional way a believer uh, relates to God, even if they would never claim a technical legalism is drawing them close to God. So I, I want us to look at functional legalism. Functionally, actually, in terms of how you actually relate to God, is legalism or grace defining your view of how God views you and how you draw near to him? It's a slightly different question. It's a more penetrating question, I think. Let me give you an example just from my own life. Uh, I remember a season where I was, had gotten into this pattern in my 
devotions with the Lord, so when I would read the scripture, that it just seemed appropriate and right that before I would read the Bible, I would take an extended time and review all the things that I could think of that I had done wrong the day before. So before I would open the scriptures, I would sit there and try to remember, okay, what, what okay, I was impatient, and okay, over, and over here I was lazy, and I would try to think through, and then I would repent of those to the Lord. And sometimes, after a single utterance of repentance, I wouldn't feel any different. I would still feel like it's not right for me to start reading the Word yet. So I would, I would, I would keep saying the same thing. No, no, I'm, I am sorry for that, Lord. Oh, please forgive me for being impatient. Please forgive me for this, that, the other thing. Sometimes I might do that two or three times, and, and finally, my emotions would start to feel a little more comfortable, and I would then open the Bible and begin to read. And one of those mornings, I felt like the Lord convicted me of how I was dealing with my conviction. I felt like I, I, was, I was reminded that I, I, I think that I'm turning my repentance, my confessions, into a Savior to save me, to bring me into a right place with God. Now, there's nothing wrong with confession, nothing wrong with repentance, nothing wrong with examining ourselves before the Lord, but suddenly I'd begun to trust that rather than trusting Jesus, even to read the Bible, so that it seemed to me, unless I make myself right, I don't have the right to read the Bible. And so I began to combat that by doing what for me was very, very difficult emotionally. I would sit down, I would open the Bible, and I would begin to read. And it was agonizing because it felt wrong. I, I shouldn't be reading this. I, I haven't gone through my ritual of repentance yet. But it was almost as though God was saying, well, why don't you allow the word to speak into your repentance? It might illuminate some more things. Maybe God will speak more things to you, but in the context of a right relationship with God. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about the difference between technical and functional legalism. Now, even in that moment, I never would have said, well, no, it's my confession that brings me to God. I never would have said that, but functionally, that's what it felt like. It felt like that. So I want to ask you that same question. Is functional legalism or grace the way in which you get close to the Lord? How does God view you? Does that view of you change based on what you do or don't do, what I do or don't do? Very, very important. I want to try to examine this, drill this down using three words. They're, they're precious words in the teaching of grace in the New Testament. Very precious words. The first word is atonement. Atonement. How do we know whether grace or legalism is shaping and defining our functional view of God? Let's, let's answer this word, atonement. The word atonement is a, a theological word. It basically means what satisfies the punishment for sin that is necessary because God is holy and just. Atonement. There's a, this idea that there, there has to be a punishment that, that satisfies or exhausts the payment for sin, for every sin, for every creature. And so atonement is this idea of a, a sacrifice that fully exhausts God's justice against sin. So here's the question, grace or legalism. Is Jesus' death or my penance the object of atoning God's punishment for our sin? Again, functional. I know probably none of you would think, oh, I do penance every day. But functionally... Functionally, are there things that you do that I do to make up for things we did wrong? To fix, to atone for them. But Hebrews says there is one sacrifice and no sacrifice may be offered after that sacrifice. I want to I zero in on that, that marvelous verse, verse 18, and receive it as an examination of our heart. Where there is forgiveness of these lawless deeds and sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. No longer any offering for sin. So there is nothing we do to pay for the sins we commit. We may not 
pay for the sins we commit. To attempt to pay for the sins we commit is to declare to the Father that we disagree with him and we don't think Jesus' death was enough. We may not, because Christ, as Hebrews says, offered a single sacrifice for sins, and there no longer remains any sacrifice for our sins that we commit on a daily basis. No sacrifices left. No sacrifices biblically. No sacrifices that we create, that we assume will make up for those sins. No sacrifices left for sin. We can now boldly approach God as sinners because we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ that atones for, that exhausts all of the punishment that there was for every sin we ever commit or will commit. No offering may still be made. So let's ask this question. Is grace or legalism on the topic of atonement for sins, is it defining your relationship with God? functionally? Or are there things that you and I do to make up for the bad things we do so that we can then get to God? Let me just ask a couple questions. Sometimes, sometimes for me, we make an offering of holding on to a low-grade guilt. A low-grade, what I mean by that is just always there in the background. I'm guilty. And if I feel bad enough about it, long enough, I'll make up for it. That's what God wants. He wants me to feel bad about about it long enough, and that will then atone for my sins. Guilty feelings never atone for anything. They're accurate, We are guilty in ourselves. They're accurate feelings, but holding on to those guilty feelings as if feeling them makes up for sin would be like a person condemned to a death sentence saying, my bad feeling should be the same as my final punishment. And the judge would say, no, it isn't the same. It isn't sufficient. So we have to actually minimize the value of our bad feelings so that we can turn ourselves to Christ. My bad feelings never do anything to atone for sin. They never satisfy God's justice at all. I can feel bad about a sin the rest of my life to the point of depression and hopelessness, and that would never satisfy God's wrath against sin. And actually attempting to hold on to bad feelings about sin as a type of penance is in contrast to what God has done, that there was a single offering for sin and that Jesus paid that price fully and that in Jesus there is now no offering for sin. Even the holding on of our feelings of guilt for an extended period of time, no, that is not the offering God requires. It is insufficient in itself. The only sufficient offering is the finished work of Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Functional, legalism, or actual grace, what gives you confidence to draw near to God? We might, like I often do, make an offering of repeated confessions You know what I mean? I'm not talking about a humble heart in the presence of their father, humbly acknowledging their sin and asking for grace. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the mantra of if I say I'm sorry enough times, I start to feel better. Have you ever had that happen? I just, yeah, yeah, I feel bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. And then gradually, maybe this is just me and I'm weird. I don't know. I mean, it seems like there's just a point where at, at some point I noticed, yeah, I think that did it. And now I can read because I would, I'm sorry, and then I was like, I don't feel any, I don't, it doesn't change. I feel, still feel bad. So let me say it again. Holding on to that, that low gray guilt for my sin, that is not atonement. And it could be legalism. Hoping that somehow by bad feelings or repetitious confession, I have now made myself paid in full. But that's to minimize the severity of sin, the holiness of God, and it's to dismiss the value of the death of Jesus Christ. The reality is, Jesus 
And Jesus alone paid it all, not most, not some, with penance covering the latter half. He paid it all, and it is to his glory and the glory of God's grace that sinners who are unworthy and perhaps even still feel guilty can come boldly into the presence of God, laying their sins totally on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Grace commands us to see Jesus' atonement as the once for all sacrifice for our guilt, the unrepeatable and unmatchable payment for our sin, so sufficient that we can now with boldness, though still sinners, approach the very throne room of God. And there, let us do all the confession we want to do, humbly embracing the acceptance we have in Jesus. Atonement. Second word, justification. These two words are really two sides of the same coin. Justification. It's this idea that it is not sufficient before God, for someone to approach God, it's not sufficient merely that their sins have been paid for. There has to be a positive record of righteousness. So we we might think of it as a, a person going to one of those ancient kings. It's not enough that you're not a criminal. You better bring him a gift when you come in. Right? That's the idea that's presented in the scriptures. It's not enough merely to not be a convict trying to escape from his justice, and you better not come if you're a criminal. No, but but more than that, when you come to the king, you bring something positively to him. And the thing he wants, as he states throughout the scriptures, is obedience, righteousness, holiness, lived out holiness, actual, physical, real holiness by a real person. That's what he wants to see. He wants that record presented to him, and without that, no human being can approach God. That's why the psalm says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false. It's not just the absence of the condemnation of a sinner. It's the presence of obedience and worshiping and loving the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's living a life where every moment has been Godward and worshipful and loving. So, grace or legalism? Whose righteousness gets you to God? Yours or His? Mine or his? That's the question. Let's talk about this justification, this record of righteousness. What what, what does the scripture say about it? Well, it, it says a number of things. First of all, it says the means of us receiving that righteousness, the means is faith. Says this a number of places, but a, a marvelous repetitive one is Galatians 2, 15 and 16. It says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. In other words, externally, we're more godly than a lot of people. Yet, we know that a person is not justified, declared righteous by works of the law. Listen to this. We do not get our record of righteousness by our own works of the law. We do not. We do not get our record of righteousness necessary to approach God. We do not get our record of righteousness by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified, declared righteous by faith in Christ. And he says it again, not by works of the law, because Paul really wants us to get this point across, doesn't he? You notice the repetition? We're not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. We have believed in Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, just to make sure you got it, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So what is the righteousness that is presented to God, the actual lived out righteousness that's presented to God so that we can be in his presence? What is it? The means of that is not our own creating a righteous record, but receiving one by faith. Actually, to attempt to achieve our righteous standing with God by our works is not only impossible, but contrary to the means that God has given. It's not only hopeless, it's wrong. This is precisely Paul's motivation 
And after he talks about all of his human levels of righteousness, he says in Philippians 3, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So if I compare our two resumes, I trash mine and I cling to his. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So what is the means of this record of righteousness? It is receiving the righteousness of another. Jerry Bridges says this, faith itself has no merit. In fact, by its nature, it is self-emptying. It involves our complete renunciation of any confidence in our own righteousness and relying entirely on the perfect righteousness and death of Christ. Means is by faith, a receiving and renouncing of what we have, receiving what he has. What's the content of this righteousness? What's the content? Well, Romans develops this thoroughly. Romans, Paul says this, For by works of the law, again, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law the best thing it can do to us is to bring us a knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested, revealed, apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now, he develops this further in chapter 5, and he makes it clear that in God's economy, Economy, there were two people that represented humanity. There was Adam and then there was Christ. There's only two options. You're represented by Adam or you're represented by Christ. So one record or another stands in for you before God. Therefore, Speaking of Adam, he says in Romans 5, as one trespass, Adam's, led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So what's the content of this record of righteousness? The means is faith. We don't do anything to earn this record of righteousness. It doesn't come to us because we're baptized the right way. It doesn't come to us because we work in other ways and then God gives us the record of righteousness and it's not infused into us such that it's our character that is the righteousness of Christ. No, it is credited to us as a legal account. Here's what R.C. Sproul says. Protestantism really teaches a double imputation. Imputation, very important word. It means the giving of a record to another. A double imputation. Our sin is imputed to Jesus and his righteousness is imputed to us. In this twofold transaction, we see that God does not compromise his integrity in providing salvation for his people. Rather, he punishes sin fully after it has been imputed to Jesus. This is why he is able to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, as Paul writes in Romans 3.26. So my sin goes to Jesus and his righteousness comes to me. So the means is faith. The content is the righteousness of God revealed in the lived out righteousness of Jesus Christ as a stand in, a head, a representative for all those that would believe in him. And what about the security of this righteousness? I'm I'm getting somewhere with all this, all right? Because all of these ways of thinking about justification are ways that it has been emptied of its value over church history such that it becomes more like legalism. The means is faith. The content is the righteousness of Christ. And what about the security of it? So we get it, but can we lose it? Also an important question. We get it, but can we lose it? Can it be taken from us? Listen to Hebrews Well, first, let's listen again to Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So those that get that righteousness will have it permanently such that they escape the final outpouring of God's wrath on this world. 
And listen to Hebrews 7.23. says, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. He holds his priesthood permanently, his representative quality. He holds it permanently because he continues forever. Consequentially, as a result, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he, listen to this, always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those other high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. You could do a series on that passage, but just to summarize, Christ in his righteousness and in his death is our representative permanently. You will never represent yourself before God. Your record of righteousness will never be the basis on which you relate to God. You will never, I will never draw near to God directly. It will always be covered under the representative righteousness and death of my high priest who continues forever in the presence of God, Jesus Christ. Not on Wednesday night, not on Friday morning, not on Thursday after a bad day, not next month when you've had a low month, not next year when you've had a terrible expression of sin. No, you will never be relating to God based on your own personal record. It will always and forever be the record of Jesus Christ. What good news that is. The means is faith the emptying of our own record and receiving of his exclusively. The content is his righteousness and the security is eternal. So in light of this, do we see how pitiful and even sinful it is to attempt to attach God's view of us to our latest acts of obedience or disobedience? It's pitiful, and worse than that, it's atrocious. Your mothering is never the record between you and God. If you're a husband, your care for your wife, never the record between you and God. Your worst sin, bring it into your mind right now, your worst sin, if you're a Christian, tally them up. What do you think is the worst thing? It is totally punished already. Jesus' best moment of obedience, and trust me, it was the cross, his best moment of obedience, that is the record of righteousness that you have when you draw near to God. God does not see your worst sin. He sees Jesus' best moment of righteousness, and they are imputed to each other such that when you approach God, whether it's on your worst day next week or Thursday after you yelled at your boss or after you had a conflict with your spouse or yelled at your child again or looked in that wrong direction again or were lazy again or cheated again or lied again, in that moment, right then, that split-second moment before anything else is done, you have Jesus' record of righteousness covering over you. And in your absolute best hero, gold star, Olympic medal moment, the most impressive thing, the Bible verse you memorized at eight years old that you beat all the class with, or your law degree, or your engineering degree, or your work record, or your bank account, or the way you've done devotions with your kids for 10 years in a row, or the way you've always done date night with your spouse, or the way you're always humble when your parents are always cruel. Now, whatever it is, whatever comes to your mind as that's the big one, that's, that was impressive. 
I've had some mediocre moments, but that one, I mean, the angels were rejoicing on that one. Whatever that moment is, I'm better than my brother. I'm better than my dad was. I've exceeded my grandfather. I have this education level. I'm impressive because I go to this church. I'm not a believer in that kind of ridiculous doctrine. I've never done this kind of terrible practice. I do certain kinds of schooling with my children. I don't do certain kinds of schooling. with Whatever it is, that if somebody really looked into your heart and said, I'm kind of impressed by that. It never, never gets you closer to God than the moment after your worst sin. We must not be hesitant in our moments of disobedience or more confident when we obey. We can be Christ confident in both moments. In our moments where we're aware of some work of God's grace, where there was righteousness in our heart, we, we renounce any confidence in it and draw near confidently to God through the finished righteousness provided and permanently displayed in heaven of Jesus Christ. And in our worst moments, when our regret comes screaming back into our minds and we wonder how it can be that I can sit in church next to these godly people because they would not allow me here if they knew what I'd done. In that moment, we can say, Jesus' righteousness brings me to God the Father and he sees me through the lens of the perfect obedience of his Son who who perfectly fulfilled the law and honored and loved his father in every moment, even to death. And we can say, in that righteousness, I can draw near confidently to God. Now, brothers and sisters, as glorious as this is, <laughs> atonement, justification, if we stop there, we don't see fully the difference between grace and legalism. If we stop there, we don't see fully the difference between grace and legalism. You can get atonement right and justification right functionally in your heart, and you can still miss out on the full difference between grace and legalism in your functional relationship with God. Third word, adoption. Adoption. In Christ, when our sins are atoned for and his righteousness is imputed to us, we are not only forgiven, we are not only declared righteous, we are adopted as sons and daughters of God the Father. The divine judge becomes our loving, affectionate father, and our relationship with him is transformed to one of fatherly care and provision and love. Many places we could look to study this, but Romans 8 is a wonderful one. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, that is to say, not merely little children who have no access to the full resources of their father. No, heirs who are freely honored and, and included and claimed publicly by God. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Galatians 4 says the same thing. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Here's what I mean. You could have all the technical understanding, even the functional understanding of your rightness with God. My sins were paid for. The penalty's already been paid. It says in the ledger, paid in full. And it says, full record of righteousness. Check, check. But you could still function towards God as only a pacified judge. You could still have a legal framework with God, though the law has been fulfilled. He's a pacified judge, but a judge he remains. 
And this, I think, leads to a kind of cold doctrine of Reformation theology, a cold understanding of grace where we have all the right categories in Christ alone, by faith alone, for the glory of God alone. But there remains this cold relationship with God. No wonder he's a pacified judge, but a judge he remains. So ask yourself this question. Do I relate to God in the gracious provision of adoption or have I remained within the legal framework of judge and forgiven sinner? Now that's marvelous. If that's all God had ever done, that would be reason to worship and sing for eternity. That's incredible. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone. It, it's, it's the theme of heaven. And yet, even that stops short of the full experience of God's grace. J.I. Packer says this, In adoption, God takes us into his family and fellowship. He establishes us as his children and heirs. Listen to these words. Listen to them and let them evaluate and motivate you. Closeness, affection, and generosity. Closeness, affection, and generosity are at the heart of the relationship. Look at your life. Look at your way of viewing God, how you think he views you. What's on your mind when you're reading the scriptures? What's on your mind when you're not reading the scriptures? What's on your mind when you're laying in bed battling about, do I really want to read the scriptures? After you sin, when you go into a difficult moment, what's on your mind? What, what is God viewing you right then? Ask yourself these, these words. Are they defining your relationship? Closeness, affection, and generosity are at the heart of the relationship. Listen to this. To be right with God the judge is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater You can't separate them. You can't say, well, I'm going to be an adoption Christian, not a justification Christian. There was no adoption without justification. He is the judge who becomes the father. And yet, I think some Christians, even if they technically and even functionally get the righteousness thing right, they, they, they neglect to enjoy this element of the grace of God. They remain in a, what I could call, a legal framework of relating to God. I remember asking a friend one time who was, was battling with these kinds of things, let me just ask you, when you think about God, if I could just give you two words, obey God, love God, what, what, what would come to your mind? Give me, give me like a scale. And I think maybe we'll say, well, obey God, way up here. Love God, way down here. Now, I'm not suggesting they should be reversed. <laughs> because loving is obeying, as Jesus said. If you love me, you obey my commandments. I'm not, I'm not saying, forget about obeying, just love God. No, I'm not saying that. But, but I am wondering whether sometimes functionally, there's a way of viewing God that it's, it's all focused on the master-servant angle. It's all focused on the obedience king angle. It's all focused on the, the do the right thing before the judge angle. He's pacified. That's not meritorious. I, I don't trust in these things for my salvation. I know that's wrong. I, I know I'm not saved by my works. But functionally, too, there's still this, I'm talking to a judge. He's there on the bench, and he's pacified, but I'm living my life at this distance from him. I, I wouldn't dare bring a righteousness to him, and I don't think he's still angry at me, but he's still way up there, and I'm still way over here. Is closeness, affection, and generosity... The definition of your relationship with God. Because, and here's such a, a beautiful truth about the way God has done salvation, because it is the way God views you. So even if you don't and have never viewed God that way, God has always viewed you that way in Jesus Christ. So your lack of feelings of sonship or daughtership before God have not changed his fatherly affection towards you in Christ. God views you as a father does, even if you still view him as a judge. 
There's no probation to the father-child relationship with God. Even to atone for neglecting that side of the relationship for your whole Christian life. We must remember that. Contrary to popular vocabulary and assumptions, unsaved men and women <clears throat> do not have access to God as their loving father. They do not. And if you're here and you're not a believer, I need to tell you that seriously and I hope compassionately, God is not your loving father. But if you believe in Jesus, he adopts you and he makes you his own. If you claim Jesus as the sacrifice for your sins so that God the judge is satisfied, that judge gets down off the bench and he adopts you and brings you home. And he will take you home forever and you will never lose his affection and tenderness towards you. And let me also say, if you've struggled, maybe your earthly father is not affection, generous, or close with you. Uh, that's okay because all earthly fathers, the very best of them, is just the dimmest reflection of what God the Father is like. And remember, it's not our sonship that makes God wants to treat us as a father. It is Jesus' sonship that he is relating to when he relates to us. And even on the cross, Jesus the son said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that's the kind of son that God views as <coughs> your record. Brothers and sisters, do you pray as though God listens to your prayers as a loving father does his cherished child? Do you worship as though your worship is received by the benevolent ears of a loving father? Do you ask for help as though the Father is bending to you, lifting you up and carrying you forward in your suffering? Do you read the scriptures as though God the Father and his saving Son are there with you through the presence of his Spirit, illuminating their love for you and inviting you into further childlike dependence on him? Is childlike affection and trust descriptive of your relationship with God. Legalism is a stubborn aspect of our heart. And it takes a lifetime for grace to root it out. Where we obey in the context of this relationship and we honor God in the context of the relationship and we confess sin in the context of this relationship but we don't allow legalism to change this relationship. So my youngest son is almost two and he runs everywhere and my most recent favorite thing that happens at the end of each day is when I come home and he hears the door, he says, Dada, and he comes running. His little stumpy legs. And my boy has a full face, so he bounces on the way. <laughs> so he bounces all the way there. I wouldn't want him to do anything different because that's how I feel about him too. God knows that feeling. That's how he feels about his son. And he's chosen to give you, if you're a believer, the feeling he has for his son, he's chosen to give that feeling to you. If I can anthropomorphize God, <laughs> the view he has of his son, Abba Father, he gives to you. Do you see how legalism, even if you get the technical categories right, it could still be a legal framework rather than affectionate one, a gracious one, a confident one, a loving one. 
My son doesn't evaluate his demeanor as he comes running. He's not assessing how many times he obeyed and disobeyed. He's not wondering if he can bring me some offering before I take him up in my arms. He's not wondering what mood I'm in today based on his day. He's just running and holding his arms up and saying, Dada! Brothers and sisters, that is what we are invited to. Undeservedly, shockingly, but paid for in full. All of the scandal of that was put on Jesus on the cross. So if you feel like that's a little bold, brash, daring, scandalous, yes it is. Because you are not a cute, cute, chubby little kid. And I'm not either. We were broken and still broken, rebellious and often still rebellious, stubborn, angry, self-righteous, petulant, judgmental, bitter, and idolatrous group of people. God love us. <laughs> and even when we're growing in righteousness, if you're like me, you still see that junk in your heart. And somehow, because of the death of Christ, all of that scandal of that kind of person running to a holy, perfect, righteous, beautiful, glorious, eternal, all-powerful God has been dealt with in full. In heaven, somehow, that person is viewed according to the perfect glory and beauty of God the Son and is lifted up with the same affection that the Father lavishes on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this is a Christmas present question. Is God's grace or legalism functionally shaping your relationship with God. If you are a believer, God relates to you by His grace in Christ, atoned, justified, adopted. Let's draw near to Him. As the hymn writer puts it, Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now. And we come based, Lord, on your grace, your scandalous grace revealed in the atoning death of God the Son on the cross in his righteousness imputed to us and in our new standing as adopted sons and daughters called lovingly into your presence. Lord, I pray right now for anyone who has been suffering under a wrong view of you, an inaccurate view of you, a, a legal view of you. I pray for them, Lord. Lord, if they see that way of thinking in their heart, and they have not been enjoying the full glory of your grace, the scandal of your grace, Lord. Let it right now, Lord, please, Lord, please let it penetrate their heart. Lord, please, I pray, Lord, I pray, even those that for, for decades have had this, this exclusively legal framework of you, functional penance and unwillingness to come boldly, Lord, that, that you would reveal through your spirit, Lord, your word says that the spirit himself 
cries within us, Abba Father. I pray you would fill the members of this church by your spirit and that they would hear that cry and come running to you. Lord, I, I pray for that. I pray for that right now, Lord. Let them feel the reality of your affection and closeness and generosity towards them. Please do that, Lord. And this week, Lord, as they open your word, as they see a new moment of sin, as they experience conviction, Lord, let your grace define that moment. Let them come boldly to you, whether it be in tears of repentance or in joyful celebration of you. In any case, Lord, let them in embrace the glory of your grace. Please do that, Lord. Please set them free from a wrong legalistic view of you. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking the scandal of this entirely on yourself. Lord, thank you for giving us what you deserve, Lord, uh, to call your Father our Father. Lord, you're so generous, Lord Jesus. Lord, that relationship was yours to have, yours alone. It was your right. And you share it with us. Thank you. Help us to relate to you as you are. God of grace. In your name we pray and we sing.